money has a way of getting our attention, doesn't it? I used to use these little gospel tracks, these gospel leaflets that uh, they looked like a wallet that was open and had money in it. You kind of would drop on the ground and you'd be amazed how people would notice that. And like, oh. I stopped using them because people got so bitter that there wasn't really money in it. But it is amazing how money kind of catches our eye. How we're drawn to it. It's also amazing how controversial it is to talk about money. Our sister churches, our group of churches, Calvary Chapel, we're kind of known for those who don't ever want to talk about money. That's one of the reasons we don't pass a plate. We're almost allergic to it. But if we're not going to talk about money, then what that means is we have to ignore a whole lot of what Jesus had to say. Because Jesus talked a lot about money. About what we should do with money. About what the purpose of money is. About the dangers of loving money. Now, in the church, historically, there's been two sort of extremes. One has been what we might call poverty theology. And that was this idea that God wants you to be poor. And the more poor you are, the more spiritual you are. So to be poor is to be mature, was this thinking. It kind of promoted, it was one of the things that that promoted the monastic movement where people became monks and nuns. They gave up all worldly possessions because that's, that's, well, that's spirituality. That's how you get close to God. That's not actually what the Bible teaches. The other extreme, which is really popular today and fits really well with a lot of our Western thinking, is prosperity theology. And prosperity theology is this idea that what God wants is He wants you to be rich. And if you're really spiritual, if you really have faith, you're going to be rich. That's also not what God says at all. Now, the answer to this is, is, is not some sort of middle-class theology. <laughs> we are neither poor nor rich, okay? The answer to this is going back to what Jesus said. Now, remember, we're doing this series, the words in red, for this reason. We want to hear what Jesus said, not just what Christians say. What does Jesus say about these things? If He is indeed our Lord, and He is, we want to hear what He has to say about these different issues. I want you to remember as well that the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus, he's gone up to a place where he can be easily heard. He goes to a mountain where the acoustics are really good. And he makes his disciples gather around to him. He sits down and he begins to speak these things. And we said in the very beginning of this series that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, what he's doing is he's speaking to his disciples. He's communicating directly to those he's called to follow him, but he's doing it for the benefit of the multitudes. There are literally thousands of people listening to him as he's giving this sermon. So he's, he's addressing the disciples, and we need to remember that because he's addressing those who have answered the call to follow him. Jesus calls these guys to follow him, to be his disciples, and they believe that he's worthy of that, and they begin to follow after him. So he says, okay, here's what it looks like when you follow me. He gives the Sermon on the Mount. But he's doing it so that the, the, those that, of the multitude that are listening to him could think, okay, do I want to be a Jesus follower? Is this something that I think would be good? Is, this, is, is he someone I think I can trust? And so when we get to the section of John, or I'm sorry, of Matthew chapter 6, we see Jesus saying these really familiar words. He begins to say, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Literally, do not treasure your treasures on earth. Now, I'm going to give you three main ways that I think we can follow Jesus when it comes to money. Okay, and remember, I'm I'm addressing, like Jesus, I'm wanting to address first and foremost those of you who have responded to the good news about who Jesus is. You believe that he's died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe he's risen from the dead You believe he's ascended to the right hand of God. You believe that he's coming again in glory. You believe these things, therefore this is what God would call you and I as believers to do. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I don't sure if I believe those things yet. I'm not really sure about all this Jesus stuff yet. What's this got to do with me? Well, I want you to listen, please. You don't tune out. And I want you to think about what Jesus would say about money. And you see if it doesn't intrigue and challenge you. So he starts off with this idea, and here's the first of three things. He says, he calls us to invest in eternal things. Notice what he says, 
Do not lay up for, your, up for yourselves treasures on earth. He says, why? Moth, uh, moths and rusts destroy and thieves can break in and steal. What do you want that for? But notice he says in verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Notice both times he says, lay up for yourselves. He's encouraging us to invest with a hope of return. That's why we invest, isn't it? Anybody here who has any money to invest, you don't just uh, put money into investments because you hope, we might be fun, let's see what happens. You hope that investment brings a return. You hope when you invest 10,000 pounds that you get back 12,000 pounds. Am I right? That's what you want. You want a return on your investment. Jesus is saying, okay, listen, your investment will have a return if, he says, you invest in eternal things. Now, he makes it really clear, right? He says, look, if you're investing for, in stuff, if your desire is to have more stuff, I want to have I want to just have that 12 grand, or I want to just have that bigger house, or I want to just have that nicer car. If that's what you're investing in, he says there's a foolishness to that. Why? Because these things all fall apart. They all rust, or get moth-eaten, or get stolen, or get taxed away by the government, (laughs) whatever the case might be. In fact, interesting, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 12. I'm reading here from the New Living Translation, because I like the way New Living Translation paraphrases. I'm going to use a lot of uh, verses from that uh, version today. He says, Then Jesus said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Why? Because life is not measured by how much you own. But let's be honest, doesn't it feel like that's how life is measured? I, I know when I go back to visit the United States and I'm with people who have a lot more materially than I do. And if you've been to my house, you know I'm not poor. I kind of feel like, oh, I don't quite measure up to these people. They have nicer holidays. They have nicer cars. They have big screen TVs in every stinking room of the house. And we can feel this, can't we? But Jesus is clear. You know what? Beware. Guard. He didn't just say, it's not such a good thing. He says, beware. Guard against that kind of greed. Of always thinking the answer to our life, our life is going to be measured by what we have. It's not. He says, instead, lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven. In other words, invest in things that can't be Eaten by moths, or rust can't destroy, or thieves cannot break in and steal. Now, let me just cut to the chase. I can only think of one thing that lasts forever. It's you. It's people. Souls. Jesus is calling his disciples to let their investments be in that which lasts forever. Now, obviously, It's not as if we can just say, okay, there's a box in the back, put your money in there, and automatically more souls will go to heaven. The Catholic Church had that uh, arranged in some ways earlier. You could pay for indulgences and maybe get someone out of purgatory they used to teach. But that's not biblical. No, we're talking about having an eternal mindset. and say, In other words, saying, okay, how I arrange to spend the money that I have, I want to spend that money in such a way that it's building the kind of relationships that get people to turn out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That, helps, that help people know who Jesus is and why they should follow him. That's what we want to invest in. And it's interesting because he says this, notice in verse 21, he says, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Do you understand what he's saying? He says not only will your investment, it will have a return, but also your investment will direct your heart. Notice he didn't say your heart directs your investment. He says your investment directs your heart. If you as a Jesus follower aren't not bothered really by how many people you know who don't know Jesus... Maybe the issue is a matter of investment. You're not spending much time in developing relationships, serving those people, sharing with those people, praying for those people. Maybe your priorities aren't where they're 
meant to be. And so you're, you're investing in things that actually don't knit your heart to heaven where God's going to have his people forever. They knit your heart to here. And so Jesus makes this call. Listen to this. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. Again, quoting from the New Living Translation. Paul writes, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, that's you if you're a Jesus follower, if you're a believer, set set your sights on the realities of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, I love that, Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. Do you think when you get to heaven, again, I'm talking to you guys that are Jesus followers already, do you think when you get to heaven and you see God face to face, when God's glory comes, when the kingdom comes in its fullness, you're going to go, is this it? I went to church every Sunday for this. I gave money to that movement for this. Do you really think it's going to be? Because if you think that's what it's going to be, you don't yet know Jesus. No, Jesus says, I want you to invest in eternal things if you're my followers. Second thing, know who you serve. Look at verse 25. He says, Jesus says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your body's full of light. If your eye is bad, body's full of darkness. What's he talking about? This phrase, this idea of the, the, the lamp being in the body of an eye, it's a metaphor that means what you look at, what you desire, is the thing that directs where you go. So if you have a lamp, you have a, a lamp, and that lamp you hold in front of you because it shows you where you should step. Are you following me? So this is what Jesus is meaning. He's saying, okay, th- this is meant to, to kind of direct you. So if your direction is good, literally single, I think um, the old King James is single, If your direction is good, if it's single, if it's in the right direction, guess what? Your whole body, your whole life is going to be full of light. But if it's bad, if your direction is bad, your whole body is going to be full of darkness. Your whole life is going to be full of darkness. Now this is important because it's going to connect to what he says in verse uh, 24. So when he says, if that light there for you is in darkness, how great is that darkness? If the thing you think that's driving you, that's given direction to your life, is actually a bad thing. To be living your life for. Well, how bad is the rest of your life going to be? This is why Paul says, and I didn't put this on the screen, sorry, but why Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Because when money drives us, when it's what's kind of we're following and moving us forward, when that happens, we get into all kinds of bad things. We buy presidencies and blow up people. This is what happens. Now, notice he says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Now Jesus is being very clear here. When he says no one can, or when he says in the the bottom of the verse, you cannot, there's no room for budging there. Now, because so often when the Bible talks about servants and masters, when the New Testament talks about that, we tend to kind of jump right to the application of employees and employers. We read this and we go, well, I don't know. I, sorry to disagree, Jesus, but I think I can serve two masters. It might not be the best thing, but I think I could do it. I've had two jobs. I've had two bosses. They both got on my nerves. They both wanted me to work at overlapping times. And there was competition and it was difficult, but you know, you work it out. It's not the best, but you work it out. But he didn't say no man can have two bosses. He said no man can have two masters. You can have two employees, but you can't have two masters. A master means they own you. You belong to them exclusively. Now, let me kind of tie together these two little sections, 22 and 23 and 24, okay? So when Jesus is talking about this thing that desire, that our desire determines our direction, we have to ask ourselves a question. It's begging us to ask ourselves a question. What do we really want? What do you really want? 
yeah, the context is money. Do you really want money? And many of us here would probably say, no, I don't want more money. I'm happy. I don't need more money. But, but it's begging a bigger question now. What do you really want? Because what you really want most is your God. And you pursue that God by faith. Now, some of you now who aren't, you know, you're still looking into this Jesus stuff, you're like, oh, no, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not sure if that's true because I'm not really pursuing anything by faith. I'm just doing what's reasonable and logical and right. Well, there's no contradiction between faith and reason. But let's be honest, you are, you are putting your hopes and dreams based on something that you think I want. I'm pursuing what I want. The pursuit of what you want is what faith is. It's the pursuit of who you trust and what you want. What do you want? But also, Jesus brings it up really clear, right? In verse 24, who do you serve? Because you can't serve two masters. Who do you serve? You see, what Jesus is doing here is what he did over and over again with the, his disciples, those he called to follow him. As they followed him, he was constantly kind of resetting their focus. He was constantly trying to bring them back to a place where they thought about, okay, what is it that he actually wants? What does it mean to be in the kingdom of God? What does it mean if Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Christ, God's chosen king? What does it actually mean? And what it means, according to Jesus, is an exclusive allegiance. Jesus, you are my God. You are what I want most. You are who is worthy of my service. Now, listen to what Jesus says himself in Luke chapter 14. Jesus says, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, let's be honest. Doesn't this challenge our kind of quick thoughts as Christian parents that I'm a good steward of my money if I'm making sure my kids have a better life than me? Doesn't that challenge that thought? If my goal on money is I want to make sure my kids have a better life than me. And I say that from somebody who grew up by American standards, dirt poor, and really, really wanted to make sure my kids had a better life than I do. Than I did. But is that really the primary motivation for using our money? Because Jesus says, no, it cannot be your wife and your children, your mother, your father. And if, if those of you who come from uh, honor cultures, where your whole sort of background is based on what your parents think, honoring your parents. It's a good thing to honor your parents. The Bible even says that. But this honor culture where everything is about, am I honoring them by what I do or am I shaming them? So that you might even lie to save face and to make sure that you don't dishonor them some way. Jesus is saying it's not an option if you're going to follow me. There has to be an exclusive allegiance to me. That's serious stuff, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I read that and I think, man, Lord, am I, should I really say that I'm a Christian? <laughs> I mean, I, I understand the good news of what you've done for me. I believe that the gospel is that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I'm sure of that, God, but I look at my life and there's so many things that are competing for allegiance to you. And one of them is money. It's a, it's a, it's a pull. I'm, I'm being honest. It's a constant pull. What's really important and so this is why Jesus is saying, listen, when he's talking about money, he says, look, know who you serve. Who is actually worthy of your allegiance? Is it yourself? Is it your parents? Is it your children? Is it your boss? Or is it Jesus? God, 
who became man. Now, the last bit gets a bit practical. And this is where Jesus wants us to think about, okay, look, if you're investing in eternal things and you know who you serve, then here's what I want you to learn. I want you to learn to be content. That's the third thing, learn to be content. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry. Does that seem a bit trite to you? It's easy for you to say, Jesus, you're Jesus. (laughs) You're God's son. Of course, you're not going to worry. But actually, we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as a human, agonizing over what the Father called him to do, sweating great drops of blood, entering into our pain. He knows what it's like to go, oi, what's going to happen? But I love the fact that he says this, do not worry, three times. Notice, in verse 25, do not worry. We just read it. In verse 31, do not worry. In verse 34, do not worry. He says it three times, and 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 all three times, he's wanting to bring something else up. And here's here's what I think he's doing. He's wanting us to identify what actually causes us to worry. What is where is it that worry begins to creep up? He says, verse 25. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, let me ask you this question, because I think, again, this question that Jesus is asking begs a question about how we can identify the cause of our worry. That is, do you assume that your human existence is primarily physical. Is that your assumption? I am a body. Now, we could talk all day about this, couldn't we? If our primary existence is a physical body, can you see how susceptible that makes us to things like body image? How things like ageism? Things like devaluing those that are, are disabled? If we say we are primarily as human, what makes us human is our physicality. We're able to enunciate words and we're able to do things that other primates can't do. If that's our existence, if that's what defines what it means to be human, our physical existence, then that causes all kinds of problems, doesn't it? But that's not who we are. We're not a... We're not bodies that have souls. We're souls that are in bodies, according to Scripture. And really good news, this old body, and I'm telling you, this old body, I had to wear a wig yesterday because I just can't outgrow hair. And it was an 80s party it was at, and you can't be a bald guy at an 80s party. So I had to wear this ridiculously stupid-looking wig. And I rocked it. But the thing is, These bodies are aging. They're getting old. My chest is going down. My belly's going out. Like I said, my hair's disappearing. What I have on my face is turning gray. It's crazy. Even even when I try hard, I'm exercising. You know what exercise does for me? Sore joints, stiff muscles. (laughs) So the young people are going, whatever. The old people are all laughing. You're right. I know exactly what you mean. And if, if, listen, if my human existence, if my life is about my physicality, it's a sad day indeed. It's getting sadder by the day. But it's not. According to Jesus, my life is more than my physicality. I, I am a, a spirit that, hold, that is contained by a body. And the good news is this, listen, I'm going to get a new body. Because Jesus was resurrected, And he, though the same Jesus, he has a new glorified body. When I'm resurrected, I get a new glorified body. Can't wait for that. I'll have hair. (laughs) Like Elvis hair, like really cool, thick, wavy. Now, why we, we worry? We often worry because we do think our life is about the physicality. It's about the physical. It's about the material. It's not. Your life is way more important than that. You know, and the older you get, you, the more you realize that. Not just because you see the limits of our physical selves, but because you, you appreciate that sometimes the drive to take care of our physical selves 
actually keeps us away from the things that are actually more important. Relationships. People. Jesus. But he also says this, look at verse 31. He says also, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles think unbelievers, not non-Jewish, but unbelievers at this point. All these things the Gentiles seek, notice, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's saying, you have a good Father in heaven who will take care of you. That's what he's saying. You have, a good, you have a good father. So ask yourself this question. Do you worry because you doubt the goodness of God? I know that happens to me a lot. God, I know in my head you're good. I know from your word you're good. I know from the cross and the resurrection you're good. I know from Jesus you're good. But this stinks what I'm going through right now. And if you're so good, why is this so hard? But, you guys, Jesus makes it really clear, even in this context, that he's not promised that his goodness means we're not going to have problems. Guys, listen, our hope is that God is good. Do you realize when we are bothered and stumbled by this idea that if there's a good God, why is there so much evil in the world? Do you realize that's proof that there's a good God? Because why would you even think, why would you even dare to think that there would be good that would automatically be available unless there was a good God. You long for there to be a good God. And the good news is that that good God pierced history as the person of Jesus to prove that God is indeed that good and will forgive us for the wrongs done to Him and done to others and will change us from the inside out. And one day, we'll rid the whole world from all sickness and sin and death. Amen. But what about this? Verse 34. Do not worry, he says, about tomorrow, for tomorrow worry about itself, sufficient for the days or its own troubles. Notice he didn't say, today's good, so don't worry about tomorrow. He says, no, you've got enough more things to worry about today. Just deal with the problems today. Here's the third thing that, that tends to be what causes our worry. Listen. Do you think you can control the future? Do you think you can control the future? Now, let me be really clear. In fact, let me quote someone much wiser than me. Uh, uh, one of my favorite Anglicans, a guy named John Stott. He wrote this. He says, Jesus, speaking of this context, Jesus is not forbidding thought. In other words, he's not saying, don't think about the things that are around you. Don't think about the needs in your life. He brings that up because, again, the old King James, the authorized says, do not give any thought to what you'll eat, what you drink, what you'll wear. But he's actually not saying that. He's saying don't worry about it. He's saying don't, he's not forbidding thought. It's, it's appropriate for us to think. It's responsible for us to think about what do I actually need? Nor, listen, is he forbidding forethought or planning. Read the book of Proverbs. It's all about how the wise man saves money, doesn't spend it, doesn't waste it. It's good to have forethought. What he's forbidding is anxious thought. If you're a Jesus follower, he's saying you can think about things and you will worry about things, but it's wrong for you to hold on to those worries. You have to say, God, you control the future. God, you're good. God, (laughs) I'm going to be with you forever. This is just a dress rehearsal. He calls us to that. Do you realize he doesn't just call us to that? He makes himself available to us for that very purpose. Again, sorry, it's not on the screen, but 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 talks about uh, casting your cares. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your cares on him. For what reason? He cares for you. What does it mean to cast your cares? It means, God, I am anxious because I'm thinking about it and I got these bills and I got this much money. 
God, I am anxious because I pay my bills, but I'm looking about retirement's going to come soon. I'm going to get too old to work, and I got nothing for that. God, I am thinking about the fact that, you know, my kids, they're, they're clever. They should go to university, but I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. I don't know how they're going to pay for it. What does he say to do with those cares? Cast them on him. God, I'm telling you this because you are good and you are sovereign and you are able to work all things together how they're supposed to be. So learning to be content starts with us identifying the cause of why we worry. Maybe it's, I don't know about you, but I've, I have all three of them things spinning around in my head. You know what I'm saying? All, all those things. You know, I, I'm thinking, okay, um, I, I overemphasize the physical in my life and worry about what might happen. I, I doubt the goodness of God at times. I, I, I want to try to control my future, but you know, all that stuff, it just causes worry. It doesn't help. This is why the Apostle Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 4. Listen to this. You guys know it. Uh, Joe did a marvelous job teaching on this not too long ago. Again, I'm reading from the NLT. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all that He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. We have a God who hears us. We have a God, though we have no right to demand access to Him, has provided us not just access to Him, but bold access to Him. The same kind of access that my kids have to me. My kids don't say, hello, Father. It, it, you know, I, I want to I, I just give due respect. Is it okay if I have a hug? That doesn't happen. They just say, Daddy, hug. Or sometimes they don't even do that. I just grab them and hug, kiss them. Because they're my kids. They have a right to that. They have a right to ask me for things. I had this delusion of thinking that once my kids went off to university, they were on their own. I was wrong. <laughs> I get phone calls from my son, uh, Garrett. Dad, okay, can I borrow 50 pounds? I'll, I'll, I'll pay it back. To give him credit, to give due, he always pays me back. Don't make him, but he does it. He's a good kid. But the, the, the key is this, okay? I'm their dad. They know they have access. Do you realize the privilege that you have as a Jesus follower? Because of Jesus, you have access to the creator of the universe. And you can talk to him about anything. He wants you to pray about everything. How foolish is it of us for how prayerless we often are. Now, let me say this to you really practically. Sometimes I do feel like I just can't even pray about something. I just struggle. I can't concentrate. I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed. But you know what I do? I grab somebody else. Will you pray with me about this? And when I can't verbalize, they can. Or have you ever been so anxious about something that you can't pray. You just get too choked up. What do you do? You can't even explain to somebody what's going on in your life. So what do you do? You go to someone and just say, please pray for me. And you watch how God leads them to pray for you, to lead you, to show you that he cares. He cares. This is why God says, this is why Jesus says to us, learn to be content, know what's, what's causing you to worry, and bring it to me. But also, look what he says, verse 26. He wants us not just to identify what causes the worry, he wants us to observe how God provides. He gives two examples, birds and lilies, he says, or wildflowers, we might say. Look at the birds of the air. He says, they don't they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Ever seen a skinny bird? Most of them are fat little things. He, notice he says, though, are you not more of more value than they? The point that Jesus is making here is, listen, God takes care of birds, and he's not saying, see, they don't have to work. Birds work hard for their food. Do you know that there are certain species of birds that actually store food? I can't remember what they're called, but they catch worms, and they put them on the hooks of the bushes, on the thorns of the bushes that uh, they nest in. So they have all these, like, it's kind of gross, dead worms kind of on these thorns and they eat them later on. So it's, it's obviously he's not saying, oh, don't work, don't save, don't be frugal. No, he's saying, listen, if God provides for them, how much more valuable are you? God's going to provide for you. 
He's going to make sure you have what you need. And amazingly enough, often he, we, we have what we want. But also he uses this issue of the lilies of the field, or we might say uh, wild uh, flowers. Now I'm from Southern California originally, as most of you guys know, and they've had uh, this year uh, an eruption of wildflowers. It only happens about every five or six years or so, but you get enough winter rain and all these species of wildflowers come up so that literally these hills that are normally maybe green and then mostly brown just explode in color. Ribbons of blues and purples and yellows and reds. It's just the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It's gorgeous. People are flying from all over the world into Southern California in, uh, over the last few weeks just to see this phenomenon. Flower Arm- Armageddon, they're calling it, or something like that. It's just, it's just a, it's phenomenal. It's so stunning. People fly across the world just to see it. Now Jesus is saying this, okay. If God clothes the field with this kind of beauty, okay, and here's what we do with that kind of grass. Here's what they would have done in Jesus' day. And that grass is just mowed down. It's here today. It's thrown in the oven the next day. It's used to bake bread. That's all it does. It's just quick, cheap fuel. He's basically saying this. If the purpose of wildflowers is to be pretty for a minute and then just bake bread, do you realize that you have a much higher purpose than that? Do you know why God wants to provide for you, you who follow Jesus? Do you know why God wants to provide for you? Because he wants to use your life to bring others to himself. If, if he wants to do that, and we're dependent on his provision to do that, guess what? We can know he's going to do it. Sometimes it happens in these seasons. We feel like we're just kind of a little bit green and mostly brown, but then every once in a while, God just goes, boom. And there's flowers everywhere, and people flock to what's there. And what do we say? (laughs) It's not us, but him who gives the ring. This is what he wants to do. So learning to be content. We identify the the cause of our worries. We we observe how God provides. In fact, listen to this, Romans chapter 8. This is the New King James, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Paul writes, For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to His purpose. What's His purpose for you, Jesus follower? Listen. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know what God's doing with every single aspect of your life? Do you know what he's doing, Christian? Do you know what he's doing? He's using every single aspect of your life, including your financial gain or loss, he's using that to make you like Jesus. And he wants to use that to help others become like Jesus. That's his purpose. It's a lot better than just being cut down and chucked in the oven, isn't it? If that's his purpose, his glorious plan that God has for humanity, can't we trust him to provide to make sure that plan comes to pass? Now, if this demonic bee will go away, I can finish the last point. I'm not allergic to anything. I just don't want him to go away. Last verse, verse 33. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Here's the last way we learn to be content. We make God's ambition our ambition. God, I want the kingdom. I want the kingdom. I can't wait for you to show yourself as king of kings and lord of lords. I can't wait till the kingdoms of earth come underneath your lordship. I long for that day. Do you know why we long for that? Because we look around at the kings of the earth. We look around at those who who want to be the lords of our lives. We look at the person in the mirror and we say, there's got to be somebody better than this. And there is. And his name is Jesus. 
So quickly, practically, how do we walk in this? Really fast. Let me give you five ways we can actually apply what Jesus says about money. You guys ready? Really quick. They'll be on the screen. First one, figure out where you actually spend your money. Now, if I was to come up to you, don't worry, I'm not going to do this. If I was to come to you and say, okay, how much money do you spend a month on food? You'd go, eh, about this much. You'd probably throw out a figure because you don't look stupid and that you don't know where you spend your money. But I challenge you, okay, if you don't keep a really clear budget, I challenge you to go back and look at what you, where you spent your money last month, where you spent it this month, and see where you spend money on groceries, where you spend money on housing, where you spend money on eating out, where you spend money on clothing. Figure out where your money's going. Seriously. Now, some of you guys are really great about that. Really great about that. I know that because I sometimes have to go to some of you guys for advice. (laughs) How do I do this? But some of us are not so great about this. And sometimes this is why. Sometimes we think, well, I don't really have much money to spend, man. I'm just kind of scraping by. Well, then more than anybody, you need to know where you're scraping by. You've got to know what you're doing with what God's given you or you're never going to have any kind of peace. You're not going to be able to move forward in any of these things as a Jesus follower. That's the first thing. Figure out where you're spending money. Second thing, ask God for his forgiveness and trust for his ongoing work. Now, you know why I'm saying that? Because you're going to find out you probably don't spend money as wise as you should. You probably don't. I'm required by my sponsoring churches that every year figure out to the, to the, to the dollar where we spent our money. And it's fear and trepidation when we have to go through the books. Now, for the most part, we, we at the end of the year go, oh, okay, actually, we've been pretty good stewards. We're okay. But sometimes it's like, you know what? I spent that much money on that. That money I could have spent somewhere else. Or sometimes I think, you know what? I'm spending that much money there, but I'm not budgeting anything for this thing here. That's an important responsibility that I have. It's not always about just knowing we have money so you can give it to somebody else. Sometimes it's knowing you're taking care of those who you're responsible for. And I'll tell you what, when you do this, you're going to need to say, God, forgive me. I'm not the good steward I need to be. And you've got to trust that he's continuing to work in your life through this. Third thing, commit to sac- systematic and sacrificial giving. Ah, here it comes. The church guy's talking about money. Hey, we're not passing the plate. I'm not going to do it now. I'm talking to you guys who are Jesus followers as Jesus was, those he's called to follow you. You need to think about committing. Did I even say give it to Servants Church? No, I did not. Though that's probably a good place to start, to be honest. The Bible says share with all good things to those who teach you. There should be a commitment to local church. I'm not saying how much. I'm saying commit to systematic and sacrificial giving. You can't sacrifice if you don't know what you got, can you? You can't even budget. A, a, a systematic giving if you know what you got. Again, many of you guys already do this and well done. Thank you for that. Fourth thing, seek a plan to eliminate your debts. Now, I'm not going to give you a financial seminar, but you probably all know there's good debt and there's bad debt. If you are still paying off a mortgage, but your house has a, more value than your mortgage, that's not bad debt necessarily. Okay, so I'm not necessarily saying you have to pay off the house. But I am saying, you guys all know, you know, if you have credit card debt, or if you keep buying things on debt, or you can never get out of your overdraft, it might take you two years, it might take you three years, but start thinking about a plan. If you need help with that, we have people in the church that can help you with a budget. Because again, you can't say, God, I want to live for you with my money if you have no idea what you're doing with your money. Last thing. Seek a plan to be more available for mission. I say this because... This whole talk is not just about money. It's about making sure we're not just living for money. Do you know what I mean by being available for mission? For those of you who are moving towards retirement, rather than thinking about, okay, I'm a re- I want to retire <coughs> and I want to live in this, this sense of comfort. Maybe you may think, okay, Lord, I'm going to be able to stop working for a living when I get to this certain age and I want to be able to do this mission when I retire. So I want to move from doing this for a living to just living for this, to see God's kingdom furthered. But maybe you who are younger, maybe you students who are going to get ready to go out of university, maybe you need to, instead of, instead of like, I'm out of university, I get a job, now I've got to go buy the car, I've got to buy the nice house, I've got to buy the good stuff. Maybe what you need to do is say, okay, I'm going to get out of university, I'm going to give a year or two to the Lord to do some ministry. 
you know, there's a, a, a group, uh, there's a church, uh, it's actually a, you know, not to be harsh, but it's actually a cult uh, called Mormonisms, but Mormonism, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Very nice people, but they believe in a different Jesus. So it's not a Christian religion. But they, you know, here, here they believe something that's a lie, but almost every one of their people go on a two-year mission. Are we willing to do for the truth what they do for a lie? How much impact could we have if everybody, not just the called, paid, holy guy, if everybody thought, God, how, what mission do you want me involved in? How much more impact would we have? Seek God about that. God, what would you have me do? So here's, here's what we're talking about. This is not just Jesus talking about money. This is Jesus talking about your life. Now for you who aren't Jesus followers yet, let me first say, I apologize because so few people actually live this way. So few people who claim to follow Jesus actually live this way, myself included. I still struggle with this. But I would rather stand here and say, man, I fall short, than say, well, let's just lower the standard. Because Jesus sets a standard for us for our good and for his glory. Let's be those who are investing in eternal things. Let's be those people. <clears throat> Let's be those people that remember who it is that we serve. Let's be those people that follow Jesus as we learn to walk with him and be content. Amen?